I'm Jen Santry, I'm with the High Country Conservation Center, and we're just, um, this is Susie Knopnagel, she's been nice enough, from La Summit Landscaping. She's been teaching this class for a couple years now, so she's nice enough to continue doing it, and I really appreciate it. And what I handed out was, um, is a list of what you can grow here, based on gardeners and our farmers that help run our CSA that we have. So it's um, pretty detailed and specific to our community. And um, if you have any suggestions or if you have any thoughts on it, please let me know because we co um, constantly are changing it from year to year. Um, I just want to tell you a couple of things about the gardens and then ask you if you have any questions. I'm guessing most of you guys are community gardeners. If not, um, you're totally fine being here to learn about home gardening too. Um, but basically, community gardeners and anybody can go to summitgardennetwork.org and if you haven't been there, that's pretty much where everybody signed up for online applications. If you, um, if you haven't been there, it's a great resource. In fact, you'll find this list on that website. So once you get there, there's a page called resources or drop down menu called resources. If you click on that, it takes you to mountain gardening. And that page has a ton of resources, including um, some tips for beginning vegetable gardening, which you'll hear some of it. It's like sort of a synopsis or summary of what she's talked about in the past. You can download that. Um, all the videos that Jenny has been taping from last year and this year will be posted there too. We have four videos from last year, um, a class similar to this, um, a class on soils, a class on advanced gardening, which is similar to the um, class that's going to happen in a couple days. I forgot what the date is for that one. Monday. Monday, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> on Monday. And then there's another video on um, planning your garden. And you can access those anytime. There's also a bunch of information from CSU Extension and Master Gardeners. Um, Plant Talk, which is a great website. So go check it out. Um, if you have questions about gardening, there's a great resource to go there. Well, I'm going to hand it over to Susie. And um, if, again, if you have any more questions, information here. And you guys have a good night. Thanks so much. Great. All right. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> All right. Well, so again, my name is Susie, and I work with the Summit Landscaping Garden Center, which is the one on Airport Road in Breckenridge. There's a lot of good garden centers in the county. So we're not, this isn't like an advertising pitch. I'm just here to talk to you guys about growing vegetables. Um, and try to help you guys with any questions you might have and get you started. If you have grown vegetables in California or Florida or you know some other place, it's going to be a really different experience here. The thing we really want to emphasize is you can grow awesome vegetables in Summit County. It's just going to be some different vegetables than maybe you were growing in California or wherever you had been before. And the obvious reason is just due to our climate and our temperatures. Um, so we'll kind of go into that in a little bit. Another quick thing I want to know is how many of you are going to be more in the Silverthorne area? Okay, how about Frisco? Then how about Breckenridge? Anyone like other interesting places? Summit Cove, Dillon. Summit Cove, okay. Anyone else know like Park I'm Park actually in Dillon Valley, but okay. Silverthorne. Yeah, okay. Great. All right. Cause there are obviously going to be a little bit of differences just based on elevation in Silverthorne. It's a good thousand feet lower than a lot of the places in Breckenridge. Um, I personally live at 10,400 feet and I have five raised bed vegetable gardens and I get a ton of vegetables. So I always am able to throw that out there as a good example of you can do a lot in Summit County. So hi there. Yeah. Take that seat. That's great. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry. You go. This is a list of the veggies we're going to talk about. So, yeah. I have a question. What do you, clear, how can you clarify raised bed? What do you mean by yes. that? Yes, okay. So that's a really good question is, what is a raised bed vegetable garden? You can grow anything, like right into the dirt, in the ground. Hi there. Hi, oh, sorry. Here. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, you bet. Um, but the really nice way to build a garden bed for vegetables is to build what's called a raised bed vegetable garden and it's where you're going to take like at least a 12 inch high um, exterior and it can be made out of wood or I mean they make them out of metal they're made out of all kinds of things um, and then you fill it with soil and compost and get a good planting medium in there so rather than just using the dirt that's already out there in the ground, you're creating a really good foundation to grow your vegetables in. So all of you that are growing in the community garden plots have raised beds. That's what they have built in Breckenridge and Frisco and Silverthorne. The beauty of that is you have so much control over your growing medium. It's a really nice blend of 
topsoil and then they amend it every year with compost and those community plots are amended with compost that comes from our landfill here in Summit County. It's an excellent composting facility that makes a class one compost. It's very nutritious and it's local. It's from all of our waste from here in the county, all of our food waste and it has biosolids but it's very safe, it's heated to high temperatures um, and it makes a really nutritious product for us to be growing in. So those of you who are going to be gardening at home, if you haven't already built a raised bed, that's to me the best way to go about this, um, just to make sure that you have a really good medium to grow out of. And I highly recommend the compost that comes right from here in the county. You can go directly to the landfill and if you have a pickup truck, you can purchase it by the cubic yard. It's very inexpensive. The main things for you to know is when you get seed packets, and I don't think the ones in the seed library are going to be this way, but this is one of the brands that we sell, and it's called Botanical Interest, and they have a lot of organic seeds and a lot of heirloom variety seeds, and heirloom seeds are the ones that have been passed down from generation to generation. None of these are genetically modified. They're really good seeds to work with. Um, I'll kind of just pass these around. But if you notice that on the front, it's going to say cool season or warm season. Here in Summit County, what we're growing are the cool season vegetables. If you live down in Denver, you would grow your cool season vegetables like in April, May, and June. And then in the rest of June, July, August, it's too hot to be growing most of these vegetables down at these higher, or, you know, higher temperature locations. Um, but up here, all summer long, we're growing the cool season vegetables. So that's just one of your key things when you're shopping for seeds, is make sure you're buying cool season seeds. Jenny. Does that apply if you're working in a greenhouse as well? Or? No. So if you have a greenhouse and you're heating your space, that's when you can get away with the warm season veggies. So, um, is it still, what's the name of the greenhouses Nancy's. right over here? Nancy's. Nancy's, yeah. 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 Those are going to be heated at night, and that's where you can start growing tomatoes and zucchini and corn. And I mean, I see people grow incredible things in there, but that's because it's being heated, so you're creating a climate that's like a warm season climate. When you're saying being heated, are you just referring to the solar heat that you get through there? Are you talking about actually? I think they're heating those at night. Does anyone know for sure? Do those have heaters? I, I can't say for sure. Like the, the greenhouses we have at Summit Landscaping, we heat them at night. They never get below 60 degrees. No, I don't think um, the ones over so we can, have it. They're not? Okay. So that then you, you could probably get away with more um, because you're going to have warmer temperatures to grow things. What you need to be careful about if they're not heating those at night is that at night the temperature still can drop below 50 degrees. 50 is kind of the magic number between these cool season veggies, warm season veggies, tomatoes, basil, cucumbers, they do not like to get below 50 degrees. Peppers, forget about it. If they're getting below 50 degrees at night, they're not gonna grow. So, or they're not gonna thrive. That's a better way to put it. I always have people be like, oh, well, I grow tomatoes, I got two. <laughs> and that's great. If that's your hobby, you wanna grow two tomatoes and spend all summer watering them, and. You know, but I'm talking about a thriving vegetable garden. Um, if you're going to be in a situation where the temperatures can get below 50 degrees at night, which in most of Summit County happens through most of the summer, then you need to stick with the cool season veggies. But if you are lucky enough to have a greenhouse or a heated location, then the, you can keep above 50, then you can expand into the warm season veggies. I, every year now, I buy a tomato plant and I keep it inside and I get tons of tomatoes. I just learned that, that if I just stick it in my windowsill in a sunny spot, I can grow tomatoes inside and it's really fun. But try to put them outside and leave them out at night and again, they're not going to thrive. I mean, look at all of these things that you can grow and they can thrive up here. So. I mean, this is a pretty big list. The thing to really pay attention to is this second column where it says degree of difficulty. Like, I would not have even put the things that say difficult on this list because, like eggplant, 
No, don't, you know what, don't torture yourself. Like, <laughs> throw, all the, throw all the things that say oh, easy, because those are going to, that's what's going to, you know, give you a satisfying experience this summer, is to grow all of those things. So, I guess I just want to talk a little bit about what you're looking at here. A lot of what you're going to see are either leafy green vegetables, or root vegetables, or then like the whole bean and pea, you know, category. Peas do great up here, and I think they're one of the most fun and satisfying things to grow. If you're in the community garden, one of the things you'll want to check in about is if you're growing peas, they need to be trellised. Peas are going to grow like five or six feet in height. So in my home garden, in my raised beds, I have just a really basic thing where I just have like two by twos on each side and I just put chicken wire across and then I plant the peas on both sides of it. And it just creates this great trellis. And it's really not anything fancy and it was cheap to construct and put together. But you just, those peas need something to cling on to as they grow. And they're so fun to watch them grow. They grow fast, and then you get tons of peas. That, to me, is like one of the most satisfying things you can grow up here. Um, but if you're at the community garden, just check in about what they are OK with you doing, because you are technically just renting that space for the summer. And I don't know that they want anything too permanent. So I don't know exactly the rules about that. Do they give rules? Have you guys read yeah, rules? OK. Germinating. They have some trellises that you can just borrow. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So definitely do these. They have trellises. Oh, that's Sylvania. Yeah. Oh. The, the Silverthorne Garden. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, but I know for myself, like I just grow tons of lettuces and kale and carrots. Those actually do great. Um, Especially the warmer you are, so those of you in Silverthorn are going to be psyched to do carrots because it's that's just a really satisfying thing to grow. What else is <coughs> on here? Anything that says easy, I highly recommend. <laughs> what is mashi? It's a it's a green that um, yeah, I think it's like it's like a small green. I've never actually grown it myself. But it's a, uh, anyone able to tell her better with the matcha, how do you say that? But it's, a, it's one of the green vegetables. You put it in salads. Yeah. Yeah, that one Yes, second from the bottom of the first set of page. So a couple things I just want to point out on here. Well, one where it says planting method, direct seed or transplant. I personally, I've gone through all the stages in gardening where back in the day I would start everything inside at the beginning of April and then have these little transplants and take them outside. I have gone to just doing everything by direct seed. I, if you want to start stuff inside, it's kind of fun. You can actually watch them grow in your house. I have found that the process of growing them inside and then taking those little seedlings and taking them out and planting them is it's very time consuming and arduous and I actually don't think it's that much more successful than just waiting until it's warm enough to go direct seed. Jen, who was just in here earlier, one of the first years that they started the community garden at Frisco, she actually did some studies where they did a bunch of transplants, meaning they had started them inside versus direct seed and did them like in beds next to each other. She said initially it seemed like the transplants were doing better she said by the middle of July, everything was equal. Oh, so I, and that's what I have found is that you just end up damaging so many of your transplants and killing them off that I've gone to mostly everything by direct seed. It's more economical, it's far less time consuming, and I think <coughs> at the end of the day, your results are about the same. That said, there are a couple things on here that by either doing your own transplants inside or buying transplants at one of the garden centers, you can get ahead of the game. Things like broccoli, cauliflower, some of the cabbages, some of the things that have a longer growing season, by getting that head start, you really do put yourself ahead of the game. Again, on these little seed packets, you may want to end up passing them back around. Right under where it says cool season, it says how many days 
And that should be like how many days to harvest. So this is 55 days. So technically, if all is going well, you if you plant your direct seeds on July 1st, 55 days later, you should be harvesting that lettuce. Um, but you'll see that some of like, look at these radishes, 28 days. Radishes, do radishes. If you like radishes, don't grow anything you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but these grow so fast, they're easy, they're satisfying, um, quick, you know, to just be growing these kind of things. Now here, the, like the peas, 70 days. So that's, you're gonna be not harvesting peas in July, you're gonna be harvesting peas in August and September. So just be ready for that. But I don't, I don't think I brought in like broccoli seeds, but broccoli is <coughs> one that probably has a growing season of more like 85 or 90 days. That's one that I consider buying from a transplant. So anything with a longer growing season. So time. is there a rule of where you should buy? I mean, is it supposed to be organic for these gardens? I think you guys are being told to garden organically. I'm pretty sure yeah. that if you're at the community garden, you need to garden organically. Yeah. I did ask Jen about that because some of these, the like these I'll say USDA organic on them, <coughs> there's some really good seeds out there that aren't gonna have that stamp on them. And I asked Jen, like, is it okay if you plant those? And she said yes. No one's actually policing and making sure that you planted organic seeds. Um, that said, I do think it's just good practice to make sure that even the seeds you're planting have not been treated with any kind of pesticides. So that way you're just not, you're keeping the whole process clean that way. So, but in most of the seed packets will say organic on them. Mid-June tends to be our average last frost. And that is a little bit of a misnomer. People like always think, ooh, average last frost. That means it's not gonna have a frost again all summer. No, that's not actually what happens up here. But that's when, the soil temperatures have warmed up enough and we're less likely to get below freezing and have a frost. A lot of these seed packets, you can actually start the seeds even before the average last frost because while the seeds are still in the ground, there's nothing that's gonna really get damaged if they get frosted. It's not until they have little seedlings coming up above the soil, that's what can get damaged by a frost and then kind of ruin your garden. Um, so. In Summit Cove, and you're just gonna wanna keep an eye on the forecast and see, I mean, what is it, May 14th and it's still snowing. So one thing that's happening right now is because it's staying cold is our soils are not warming up. Because part of what we all need to have happen is not only the snow to melt, but the soils to actually warm up. So people, like gardeners that get really serious about it actually go out and take soil temperatures and usually won't plant anything until their soils are above 50 degrees. Yeah, so, but for most of you, I would say early-ish June to, and keep planning until early July. One thing you can do that is called succession planting, and that's where like these radishes, 28 days to grow, you can plant some of them in early June, plant some more three weeks later, plant some more three weeks later, plant some more three weeks later, because you can get a few crops out of this. Plus these seed packets, there's a ton of seeds in here. And that's another thing I'd recommend is start, we have this whole seed sharing library, but literally if you buy a packet of seeds, a lot of times it's more than what you're gonna need. So go with a friend to buy seeds so that you can each take half of the seeds. <coughs> okay, I feel like I'm wandering all over the place. So we've talked about direct seed versus transplant. A couple exceptions here. The onions, if you're gonna grow onions, first of all, you're, the onions you're gonna grow up here are not like the big Vidalia onions you get at the store. Mm -hmm. You're gonna grow green onions that are more like scallions. That's what, grow, and I think I hear they call them bunching onions. You can grow those from seed up here, or you can buy what is called onion sets, and I know we sell them at our garden center but it actually is like a little bulb that you plant and you can buy a bag with like 80 of these bulbs for like $4. And then you plant all of these things and they are awesome. It's like, it's basically like a transplant, but it's a bulb. 
you're planting a bulb or like a tulip bulb or something, but it's an onion set. And that's a great way to get a good jump start on your onions. So that's what I do every year. And I just, get, I'll get like three bags of 80 and just have like one whole raised bed just full of onions. Because I love them and I, I eat them all the time. And, and they just grow so easily and successfully with these onion sets. Another one is potatoes. You need to start with what's called seed potatoes. And these are potatoes. You don't want to just go to the store and buy potatoes. If people tell you, like, oh, you just cut the eye out and you know, <laughs> plant that. And you know, that probably would work. The problem is almost every potato out of store, even the organic ones, have been treated with some kind of fungicide and you're going to be entering that into your garden. So you really should not just take the eye out of a real potato and grow it that way. The seed potatoes have been cultivated specifically for you to grow potatoes and they won't enter in any of the nasty stuff and the molds and potato diseases that are out there. Um, and those are organic. You can buy organic seed potatoes. We sell them. I know um, the other garden centers sell them also. They're very popular. One, this is an opinion. A lot of what I'm saying is opinion, but this is definitely an opinion. Think hard about whether you want to grow potatoes in your community garden plot. And the reason I say that is they take up quite a bit of room. And I think the easiest way to grow potatoes is to take, well, you can buy these potato bags that you actually have like these little holes in the sides. If that makes it easy to reach in there and grab them and harvest them. They're really cool. We sell those too. Or just take like a big plastic pot or ceramic pot or it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Fill that with soil. Plant your seed potatoes in there. And the way you do potatoes, it's, it's really fun. If anyone has kids, you're gonna, have you grown potatoes before? You can just got the bag. You gotta so do this, good. you're gonna love this. But if you're doing it just like in the pot, you plant the seed potatoes and you only put soil on it for like four to six inches deep. Then you water them and as the potato starts growing, it's this vine that'll start appearing. And then when you start seeing the vine, you put more soil on top, you cover it. And then the vine keeps growing and you keep covering it. And so through the summer, you just keep covering, 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 and the vine keeps growing, growing, growing. And then in the fall, the vine kind of turns yellow, and that's your sign that your potatoes are ready. And then you can just dump the pot over, and you have this whole huge thing of potatoes. It's really fun. Or you can do the potato bag, so that throughout the summer, you can reach in there and grab your potatoes without having to do the big dump. But it's fun because you just keep covering those so potato vines with as those they grow. Seed potatoes, do you cut them in half or anything? Or yeah, the seed potatoes. And actually, I think the, the directions will be on there. I think some of them you do need to cut. And I feel like the ones we sell, you might not even have to cut. But it'll stay on the package. Um, but the re like, it's, potatoes are so fun to grow. But I just don't think a raised bed garden is actually the best way to do it. And that's why I want you guys to know, like, Grow potatoes, maybe just not in your community garden bed. So, because it'll take up a lot of your space and they're kind of hard to harvest in that kind of way. And then I've already mentioned peas are the other thing that you kind of want. You need to that preparation where you have your trellis before you plant your peas. Just back on the potatoes in silver form, they have a potato uh, plot outside of the garden for the kids, and the kids plant it. And then you, anybody could come along and potatoes and they also have um, cool. uh, rhubarb okay and also another one that's just outside the garden anybody yep. can take it and that's another great one to talk about is rhubarb because rhubarb is a perennial meaning it comes back year after year if you plant rhubarb this year it's actually not going to be ready to harvest this year when you plant rhubarb the first like two years you're really just getting your root established for that plant to grow and thrive and then grow tons of rhubarb for you. But that, again, like in a community garden plot, I wouldn't plant rhubarb because you might not even get the benefit out of it yeah. this year. Maybe yeah. next year's plot holder will get it, if the plant even survives the whole amending the soil. But if you're a home gardener, I would definitely do rhubarb. Um, and you see rhubarb growing in funny places in the county, like it spreads and you, know, you can be walking down an alley somewhere and there'll just be rhubarb growing that no one has been taking care of, but that's how much it can thrive. So, 
it's, it's a fun one, but again, I wouldn't recommend it for the community garden bed. I wanted to ask you, your personal raised beds at home, have you tried different kinds of wood in the construction and better success with some type of wood than others? I would, I would say I have not had, I, I do have different ones. The four of my five are all, I just made them out of logs from my property. Okay. I didn't purchase anything. Um, and those are, I kind of like that they're starting to, now that this will be their seventh year in use, they're kind of starting to decay a little bit, which they say is actually really good. It's just adding nutrients into your soil. Um, and those have been great. And then the, the one I built most recently, I, I'm trying to remember what kind of wood, I think it was cedar that we bought. The, really the only rule is to not use pressure treated wood, because that has a lot of chemicals. Don't use pressure treated. Um, you do want to use a natural wood, and then you can stain the outside if you want, if you care about how that's going to look. And so you guys have probably seen, they sell all kind of cool like brackets with designs on them and stuff for the corners if you want to make it look really good. Um, people make raised beds out of all kinds of stuff. There really aren't any set rules for what you use. But so an easy way is to go... I think railroad ties have a lot of chemicals yeah, in them. Yeah. I would not use railroad ties. Those are treated. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Along those lines, on um, the chemicals and things, um, you, along the way you were talking about potatoes, you know, you add the dirt and everything. I've seen several people talk about using tires. You know, you kind of, it seems like there would be chemicals and things in the rubber and the tires that would get into that. Do you know? Yeah, and it's funny because I've, I've absolutely seen that. People uh -huh. use old tires. And I, that, to me, I don't want to do that. And that's, it. I don't know why, but it just seems like. I mean, I like the recycling idea, yeah. but it seems, it seems like there like would be something in the tires. potential for them to be kind of toxic. Okay. So yeah, I personally wouldn't would use be. tires, but I also have seen okay. them be used. Okay. Yeah. I would, I mean, if, I'm, if you were building a raised bed right now, I think the easiest way is to go buy just some natural wood, buy two by 12s, um, and get brackets for the corners. If you're building a raised bed, the other thing I recommend is don't build them too wide. Only build them like four feet because you need to be able to access from all sides. Or if you do build them wider, just know that you're gonna need to put like some rocks or bricks or something through the middle so that you have a path to walk on to harvest everything and take care of everything. Don't go too overboard if this is your first time ever with a garden. You know, sometimes people have like 20 things that they're gonna grow. And you know, start with like eight and see how it goes and see what you like. And you know, it's easy to overdo it. And sometimes that can end up just being really frustrating. And also keep in mind, if you're at one of these community gardens, your space isn't that huge. I mean, you're gonna be able to have a nice, bountiful garden, but it's not, I mean, what are the sizes? Like four by six? Four or by six. Or four by three by six. six. Three by six, yeah. So they're not huge. And then that's, that leads into the other thing I wanted to talk about is some of you may have heard of the concept of square foot gardening. That is a really nice way to use a raised bed vegetable garden. So here's the thing. A lot of us think of gardens as having these rows and you have your row of lettuce and then your row of kale and then your row of cabbage. The rows like that are really, that came from more traditional farming where people were do, working with acres of land and walking down the rows to get to things. In a raised bed vegetable garden, it's actually not the best use of your space. People still do it and it works and there's nothing wrong with it, but if you wanna maximize the space that you have in a three by six garden, this concept of square foot gardening is that you literally, three by six, you have 18 square feet, you divide each of those 18 plots and decide, like, okay, I want four of those square feet to be lettuce, and then I want two of them to be onions. And rather than planting rows, you take each of those square feet, and here, I'll pass this thing around, and you plant the appropriate amount of that crop in the square foot. So this is a little guide that I'll pass around, but for example, it says that, like if you were gonna grow radishes, in one square foot, you can plant 16 radishes. And that's just gonna be a more effective use of that space wow. than planting a row of radishes across your garden. Um, spinach, you can grow nine little heads of spinach in one square foot. 
then some of the other things, like if you're going to grow kale, only two per square foot. So this is kind of maybe the next step for a lot of you is to plan your garden and to really think through, like what do I like to eat? What do I want to try to grow? I've got a three by six garden, so I've got 18 square feet to work with. How many of these things can I plant and what do I want to plant? I'll pass this around if you want to take a quick look. Um, so you can kind of see in that, I, I, I think I just typed square foot gardening into Google and that came up. So it's not, you can find your own very easily. That, that was nothing special. Um, I think that was called the square foot gardening layout. So succession planning is anytime you have any of these quick growing crops. So the things up here that you would consider doing succession planning would be radishes and lettuces are probably the most common ones. The things that can grow so quickly that by then, like let's say you plant your first batch of them on June 7th, mm -hmm. and then three weeks later you put in, you know, so one of your square feet you put in the lettuce. Three weeks later you put in more. So then in another four weeks, when that one, the first one you planted is ready and you're harvesting it, your other ones are just kind of coming along so that they're not gonna be like old and overdone. They're gonna be fresh. You know, you're gonna have these nice fresh vegetables throughout the summer. So, and you know, I'm terrible about it because I don't like to, I like to use all my space right away. So I'm one of those people that's more like, Okay, I harvested everything from that area. Now I'll plant some more, and then they might not actually grow big enough. But true succession planning, you would save space so that you can have fresh greens all the time. I mean, the big thing right now is all like the little microgreens. A lot of those are just little baby lettuces, and the lettuces taste so good when they're really young, mm -hmm. rather than letting them grow yeah, this big. Just to harvest tough, them when they're tough when they get big. This big, yeah, yeah, tough yeah. A common question I've had in other classes is when does my season end up here it really is usually snowfall um, I have my best harvest in September for sure sometimes I'll be like almost a little depressed in like the end of July beginning of August like oh my garden's not doing very well and then by the end of August and all of September is when it's like oh my Gosh, I'm I, like, you know, ringing on people's doorbells like, do you want any lettuce? <laughs> um, you know, there's just so much. Um, a couple other things I want to make recommendations. Keep a notebook of what you plant, your <coughs> planting dates, and how it does. Because you'll, this is the kind of thing, and maybe you guys are all just way smarter than me, but like, you think at the end of the summer, like, ooh, I'm going to remember that my kale just was awesome this year. You won't. You know, then I keep a notebook, and it's actually really fun. Then every spring, I pull out that notebook, and I make notes the previous fall, like, boy, I had a terrible carrot crop, but I feel like maybe I just got a bad <coughs> brand of carrot seeds. I'm going to try these ones next year. Write all that down. You know, boy, I grew turnips this year, and they grew awesome, but I realized I hate turnips. <laughs> Write all that stuff down. Oh, and I've done that. I grew tons of turnips my first year, and then I was like, I actually don't like these. Like, I just didn't eat them. And it was like, I just wasted all my time and effort. And, and let, you know, then you can give them away, and I know the food bank takes them and all that. So you can put them to good use, but I concentrate your efforts where, on what you love to eat. Um, another thing I want to talk about is on those seed packets, it does talk about seed depth. Every seed packet should say on there the seed depth. Some of these, you're hardly even burying the seed. Lettuce seeds, a lot of these say to bury the seed to 0.125 inches. That's like hardly even buried. In fact, what I often do with my lettuces is I kind of sprinkle the seeds on the top and then I just lightly rake them in and then water them. So you're hardly even burying them. But the point I wanted to make is that seed depth does matter. And a lot of times people have crop failures. And then when I talk to them later, I find out that, oh, well, I stuck my finger in and put the seed in two inches deep for each one. Well, it didn't germinate because it was buried too deep. So do read what they recommend as a seed depth for each of your crops and do your best to adhere to that. And I mean, I don't know, again, if people have better tricks than I do for when it says like half an inch versus a quarter inch for, you know, you're, you are estimating, but it still gives you a good 
guideline. Like the P's, you got, you're going to bury them quite a bit deeper. Did anyone have the P? Oh, here's the P packet. It, the seed depth is one inch. Whereas the lettuce, who has the lettuce seed, is going to be seed depth is an eighth of an inch. And that eighth of an inch is actually probably almost too much. Like you're hardly even going that deep. Do they get washed away and moved? And they do on. sometimes, yeah. And that, I think, is just part of the process. Um, and with lettuces, like I said, I'll often just sprinkle all my lettuce seeds, rake them in, and then they kind of just start growing all over, and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But I also do have quite a bit of space, so I'm not being quite as careful. Carrot seeds are tiny, tiny, tiny. Like, you can hardly even manage them. And what I have finally just realized, plant a bunch of them and then as they grow you need to thin them and thinning is like painful to do but you have to do it what that means is you're going to have all these little carrots growing they're not going to grow well if they're all tons of them right next to each other you have to get in there and leave like one carrot per inch so you need to thin those greens out any of the root vegetables beets turnips you need to thin them and you're, it's hard to do because you're like, oh, I made something grow. But you've got to pick all those little guys around, the one that you want to save in order for it to actually thrive and, and grow a big carrot or grow a big beet. Otherwise, you're going to have all these tiny little carrots because they were all too crowded together. You just pull the green. You just pluck the thing out. And you know, a lot of people actually eat the greens, especially with beets, little beet greens, throw them in your salads or soups or anything. Very yummy. Yeah, you can totally save that when you're thinning them. So. so how do you know how many seeds to put in then, like when you're trying to grow, and then how do you tell them? So when it's big seeds, it'll be really easy. Like if you're growing peas, the, they're like the size of a real pea. And so it's really easy to space them every two inches apart, whatever the package says. Um, with the littler seeds, like lettuce and carrots, you can try your best to separate them. But what I'm saying is what usually happens is you end up growing more than you're actually, you're going to have to thin them out. Yeah. Oh, throughout your season, if anything starts to flower, that's bad. And you need to pinch off the flowers. The things that can flower are a lot of... Um, and it, the one exception being peas, those will have those pretty little white flowers, and that's fine. But a lot of the herbs, um, cilantro, anything like that, if it dill, if they start to flower, pinch off those flowers. Um, lettuces can even start to, it's called bolting, when they get too much heat and they grow too fast, and you need to pinch off anything that's flowering, because that's not where you want the energy of the plant going. You don't want it flowering, you want it going into the vegetative growth of the vegetable. So that's just something throughout the season. Um, weeding, you're definitely gonna get weeds. Weed seeds are everywhere. And one of the biggest questions I've had is people just not knowing how to identify a weed versus a vegetable. And it's kind of hard for me up here to tell you one from the other, but sometimes if you just let things grow a few more days, it becomes apparent like, oh, that's a weed. Um, it's usually easier to pull or something. That's <coughs> like some of your weeds. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, sometimes you bigger weeds. Really, yeah. You don't get rid of but, them. But, you know, just do be aware that weeding is part of this process. None of us are going to have a weed-free garden. Um, they're, they're out there. If the weather's going to get 28 degrees, do we just throw a plastic tarp over or? Yeah, you can do, if you're, you know, everything's planted and all your little seedlings are coming up and then we've got this little freak cold snap coming through, you can even just do like sheets or yeah, blankets. Um, that's what I usually do. I just have some old sheets around. Because really what you're doing is you're creating a frost barrier. There's just something on top of your seedlings that the frost will form on the sheet or the blanket rather than on your seedling. So that can help protect things. I mean, we sell little frost blankets at the garden center if you want a official kind of thing, but you can also just use a sheet. If you guys haven't heard of the CSU extension, this is, you know, any one of us can go online and Colorado State University has tons of this kind of information. 
about pH levels, about soils, about growing things. Um, this Summit Garden Network website has a lot of links to the CSU extension, but that is just a wealth of information. If there's anything through the season that you're needing to learn more about. I was also going to write up just two of my favorite websites, and these are from commercial um, you know, seed growers, but when you go to their website, they have tons of information about, you know, you want to grow kale? Well, kale grows best in a pH of 6.5, and you know, kind of that really specific information. So Botanical Interest, which is the brand that these seeds are, and then Seeds of Change, and they're based out in New Mexico. Um, both of these are just great websites for information. Even if you're not purchasing their seeds, they have lots of information so that you had, if you had any questions about a specific vegetable, it's a good way to get some more information. Would, beer, yeah. would raspberries or blackberries do well here? Raspberries definitely do. Um, and I do know people that actually have kind of tried to cultivate raspberry bushes. Um, they grow native, so if you're lucky enough to have that or can never seen one that. get that, um, they're, they're around and they're great. I think yeah. raspberry bush, in the, it was already planted in the last place I lived, and I, I get a pretty good crop every year. I yeah. mean, they were kind of sporadic. I'd get five or six a day, but I would get that for a good period of time. Yeah, so but if that's something you're interested in growing, I would highly recommend it. Yeah. Where do you get a, black or a raspberry bush? We sell some raspberry bushes at our garden center. Um, you can probably, the main thing is you want to make sure you're getting a raspberry bush that's appropriate for this climate zone. And that's, I, I mean, and I'm not trying to, you know, just be careful if you go to Walmart or Lowe's and buy a raspberry bush. It may not be one that's for a high altitude climate zone. We're climate zone three to four, USDA climate zone three to four. So any perennials, whether it's a flowering raspberry bush or a uh, flower should be for that climate zone. Okay. Any mulch. Do you recommend mulch on top okay. of all these seeds? So she's asking about mulching over your garden bed. Mulch is a great idea. I'll admit that I can often be a pretty lazy gardener and I often don't mulch. The benefit of mulching and what mulching means is that after you plant all your seeds, that you're putting down like some weed-free straw or some leaf clipping, grass clippings or leaves. Um, if you're going to use a mulch, one, it is absolutely essential that whatever you use is free of weed seeds. Some people will use, you know, like hay. Do not use hay. You're going to get hay seeds all over your garden. Don't use grass that could have gone to seed. Make sure that it's only like grass clippings that there's no seeds anywhere. Um, Weed-free straw, like if you can get those bales of straw. And I feel like, were they offering them at the community gardens? Those are great to just then, after you plant, to put all over. What it does is it holds moisture in and it keeps weed seeds out. So mulch is a great idea. That said, I never do it because I, I don't like the way it obstructs my view of what's going on. Um, and I think I, I kind of overwater, I, I shouldn't say overwater, I love watering. And I love every day to go out there and be like, okay, how's this doing, how's that doing? And I don't want that mulch in my way. <laughs> but if you know that, you know, it's, it is the preferred method is to put down some kind of mulch. Yeah. So, and that reminded me just to talk about watering. Who knows what's going to happen with the weather this year. A really typical weather pattern is that we tend to have a very dry June and then we get into the monsoon season of July and August. <coughs> and once you get into those daily rains, a lot of times you never need to water your garden again. Um, in that first bit, when you, everything's germinating and getting going, you don't have to water every day, but if we get into some really hot, dry, times like we often do in June, you might want to water every day. I do. Um, just to get everything germinating and going because I know that if I water one morning 
24 hours goes by and when I come back, things are pretty dry that time of year, especially if it's kind of windy and all of that. Most of these gardens, the community gardens, are in full sun. They're gonna just be getting hammered by sun, which is great for growing, but it can dry things out. Um, you know, for sure, mulch could really help you only have to water every two to three days. And then once things are growing a little more and they're bigger, they can go a little longer without water. And then again, that often tends to be the time of the year when we're just getting so much natural rain that you don't need to water anymore. I mean, when did monsoon start last? Wasn't it like July 5th or something? And then you like never had to water again. Yes. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, but this, so it's going to be, I mean, and who knows again what the weather pattern is going to be this year, but that is often the typical weather pattern. So in June is often when you need to be a little more on top of it. So as far as sun, if you're building a plot in your house, where is the best spot? Like you, want, you want as much sun as possible. So the answer is always wherever you're going to get the most sun. And if you don't have that, and you have to choose like morning sun or afternoon sun, I go morning sun. Um, also because our more typical weather pattern is that we tend to have more sun in the mornings and then the afternoon clouds roll in. So I would get the morning sun. I also like to water in the mornings if that fits into whatever kind of routine you have. I think that's, the, that's when plants like to be watered is in the morning. I know at our garden center, we're taking care of thousands of plants every day. We always try to water in the morning. And that sets everything up for just good success for being wet and then having the day of heat and sun to grow. <coughs> and they say it also helps prevent against disease, so things won't get as moldy overnight when it cools off. Can you water too early in the day? I mean, I leave my house before 7 a.m. No, so. that's fine. I mean, the, the only exception to that is if it's still freezing, okay. then don't water. Okay. Yeah, but if it's... You know, once we get into summer, usually at night our lows are more in the 40 degree range, and then it should be fine okay. to water. Anything else? All right, well, I am so excited to hear about your gardens. I hope you guys have great luck. Um, and I will give a, one last plug. If you want to come into Summit Landscaping Garden Center, we do sell tons of vegetable seeds, lots of gardening products, and we do sell a lot of um, organic vegetable and herb transplant. So if there's anything that you did want to start from a transplant, we'll have those. What are your hours now? We're not going to open till Memorial Day weekend. Okay. Um, we're setting up right now. We're kind of waiting for some snow to melt. Once we are normal hours, we're Monday to Friday, 6, Saturday, night, 5, Sunday, 4.